Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so I'm George Wilson. Uh, I'm the IBM Linux uh, Technology Center uh, Security Architect and Security Development Team Lead. Uh, and I'm in the portion of what got put into the power organization of the old uh, IBM Linux Technology Center. Uh, and we work on power systems uh, pretty much exclusively nowadays. Um, this is not my talk. This is why my name is not first on the slide. Um, this is uh, uh, actually uh, Sudhakar uh, Kapusami's talk. Uh, he's a developer on my team. He's the primary uh, uh, secure boot developer nowadays. We have some other folks on our team, uh, Shubham Pandey. Uh, Nina Jane's been developing uh, uh, SysFS code and um, uh, Eric Richter. Um, uh, has worked on Secvar Cuddle. There, there, there are many people. I have a, a, a credit slide towards the end. Uh, so I'll, since this is not my presentation, I will stumble through it and uh, uh, just ask that you uh, be nice to me. <laughs> so uh, the agenda today, I'll go through a disclaimer, objectives, uh, an intro to uh, PowerPC Secure Boot. Um, how uh, we are um, managing keys dynamically uh, in the very near future, um, and uh, uh, the tool that we are using from user space to um, generate updates and submit them. And uh, then there's a little demo of generating the updates, uh, uh, setting the variables, reading them, and actually uh, performing a secure boot. And then uh, I have a few thoughts on uh, the roadmap and, and futures. So I just have to say that these are the, the views of uh, um, Sudhakar and me and not necessarily IBM's. Nothing here may ever make it into a product in the form described. So, and then people's trademarks are their trademarks. So uh, this is, I think, the third talk in a series of secure boot talks I've given here. Uh, about five years ago, uh, we developed a, f a full secure boot solution for open power, uh, which was uh, running uh, uh, directly on uh, uh, bare metal. Uh, uh, but uh, we had never developed uh, a guest uh, secure boot solution. Uh, and uh, now we are uh, refocused on uh, power VM. And uh, we need secure boot in our LPARs. We also need it for KVM guests. And uh, primarily to meet the requirements of uh, the uh, operating system protection profile um, uh, 4.2.1 and later that the uh, uh, integrity of the OS kernel be validated before uh, handing control over to it, uh, we developed a static key solution. Now, as you might imagine, it's a real pain because you have to coordinate key rotations between uh, firmware and operating system. Uh, so, not where you want to be. Um, so, it's been available for over a year uh, in distros. Um, we haven't uh, widely uh, proclaimed it uh, just because, you know, it's got a, a number of limitations. Uh, the, the key rotation and uh, third-party module support uh, being real problems. Uh, so we're now developing a new secure boot uh, solution with uh, dynamic key management that builds on the static key solution. And um, it makes use of a new mechanism that we have uh, in PowerVM called the Platform Key Store, which gives us a little bit of uh, 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 authenticated storage uh, where we can stuff secrets and, um, uh, or, or things that are not secret, things that we want to protect, uh, like uh, uh, public keys, uh, where we, we want to protect their integrity. Um, so we're making use of this new mechanism, and uh, we've created uh, authenticated variables somewhat like UEFI, but not UEFI, and that's a really important point, and I'll, I'll go through that uh, later in the deck. And uh, we hope that by hearing about some of our problems and solutions on a non-x86, non-UEFI platform, that uh, you, know, uh, you might uh, find some value in it. So moving on, so the purpose of PowerPC uh, Secure Boot, as you might imagine, is to protect uh, the, uh, the bootloader and the kernel against modification attacks. Uh, you might also call it uh, verified boot, we call it secure boot. Um, 
Sometimes we also separate out the aspect called uh, trusted boot where we perform measurements, uh, extend PCRs and, and log uh, events, uh, uh, trusted computing style, um, which uh, we call trusted boot or measured boot. Um, so we are using appended signatures. We don't have PECOF. So we can't just leverage the existing tools and, and framework. Uh, and moreover, we need backwards compatibility with older bootloaders. So using the appended signature allows us just to stick the signature on. If it's an old bootloader, it can ignore that. And uh, th this has proven to be a, a really useful thing. Uh, it makes use of the same sign file tool that signs Linux kernel modules. Um, and uh, we used it in OpenPower to sign the kernel. Uh, uh, we had a built-in bootloader in OpenPower called Pettyboot that shipped with the firmware, so we didn't have to worry about the bootloader. Uh, it was verified separately as part of the firmware. Uh, but uh, now we're using it to sign Grub and uh, the kernel, and uh, it's a, a PKCS7 uh, 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 message uh, with some metadata and a, uh, the magic string at the end. Same magic string. Uh, and um, uh, then uh, that can be used to, to verify the, the kernel and uh, the bootloader. So this is what it looks like. You, you, you might be familiar with this if you've uh, looked at the format of uh, signed kernel modules, um, where we have uh, uh, the actual payload up front, and then we have um, this appended signature uh, at the end with the, the uh, PKCS7 signed data, uh, and then uh, we have uh, size and metadata, and then the, the module signature appended at the end. So exactly the same thing. We're using it for the kernel, using it for Grub, even though it says module signature appended. <laughs> All right. So this is the current uh, state of affairs for Secure Boot. Uh, the, the hypervisor um, uh, has embedded keys. And uh, um, uh, well, uh, actually, the, the, the firmware, the pr uh, firmware uh, has embedded keys, partition firmware, and the hypervisor uh, brings up the firmware, and um, then the firmware uh, verifies Grub, uh, and then Grub further has embedded keys and an appended signature, uh, and uh, that appended signature is what the firmware used to verify Grub. And then uh, the Linux kernel further has this appended signature, and uh, Grub can use the embedded keys to verify it. So yeah, it works. Not scalable, very painful to manage when you have to do key rotations, and we have had to do key rotations. Um, so um, how can we improve things? So this is uh, what we're currently developing. Um, uh, uh, now, users will be able to submit key update requests with a uh, user space tool we call Secfar Cuddle uh, through the kernel, through a SysFS interface, and store the uh, key material in uh, the secure storage, which is actually, we call it PKS. There's a, uh, we just talked about PKS yesterday. There's a, it's a different PKS. We have acronym overload. So in the kernel, we call it PLPKS, uh, Power LPAR uh, Platform Key Store. And um, uh, once those are stored, then we can, from the bottom, the hypervisor can bring up the firmware. The, the, the firmware can read the GrubDB and GrubDBX uh, uh, authenticated variables. Uh, uh, look at that uh, appended signature on Grub, verify Grub, then Grub can read uh, the DB and DBX um, and use those to verify uh, the uh, appended signature uh, or verify the kernel using its appended signature. Um, we support nine variables right now. They're all predefined. There is no flexibility to create new variables right now. Uh, I'll talk about why uh, in a little bit. Uh, but um, it basically allowed us to, to simplify assumptions about the code and, 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 and uh, reuse some of the open power code that we had. Um, uh, and uh, firmware uh, uses the, uh, the SBAT uh, grub DB and grub DBX, uh, and grub uses the DB and DBX. Uh, the uh, Linux kernel loads uh, uh, db, dbx, module db, and trusted cadb into respective kernel key rings, which I'll talk a little bit more about later what those actually are. And uh, uh, 
the authenticated variable naming uh, maintains compatibility with the existing tooling for open power. So, um, you know, why, <laughs> why, are you, why are we using DB and DBX for the, the kernel? It's an artifact that we didn't have to worry about the bootloader in open power. So uh, it's a little similar to UEFI, but it's not UEFI. So these are our authenticated variables. Um, we have a PK, which, which is the um, ultimate authorization and uh, um, indicator of secure boot state. Um, we uh, um, uh, have a keck. We, we have this DB and DBX, but don't read too much into these names. They don't mean exactly the same thing as they do for UEFI. Um, we borrowed concepts, and we actually borrowed code from Tiano Core, since it's got this nice uh, BSD2 clause license. Um, but uh, we don't have a central signing authority. We don't have a shim. We don't have a mock. So um, you can argue that that's a good or a bad thing. You know, I, we've seen some, uh, some sort of uh, escapes recently uh, with the central signing. So maybe decentralized signing is not so bad. Uh, and uh, the, the idea here is also that uh, administrators can easily sign their own kernels and their own bootloaders. Uh, so, uh, and and we, we deliberately didn't want to get into the business of being a central signing authority. Uh, and I talked about the, the, the awkward use of DBN, DBX. It's, it's just maintaining compatibility with our existing tooling. So we have all these, these variables. We, we, the, the, we, we have a keck, which is kind of akin to UEFI. The grub DB and grub DBX are used to verify grub. Uh, we are using SBAT. SBAT turns out to be a really important concept because um, uh, much like on uh, uh, x86, 64 systems, we have limited storage uh, even for this. We'll be expanding the PKS, uh, the uh, platform key store storage uh, in the future, but right now we're fairly constrained. Uh, and uh, SBAT is just really, really pretty, pretty nice that you can just uh, block a whole uh, uh, set of things from the past based on a generation number. Uh, so that's a, that's a, a very important thing uh, that we implemented. Um, and as I mentioned, DB and DBX names are artifacts. The, the trusted CADB and module DB uh, are used to verify third party uh, uh, signed modules. And uh, this is really important because um, if you're trying to boot a machine and you need to get to the disk, you, you have to have some way to get to the disk. Uh, and uh, you, you need to do that in a, uh, in a secure way. Uh, and not all drivers, unfortunately, are uh, uh, shipped uh, uh, in the distro, and they're not all uh, part of the, uh, the kernel. So we do have third-party modules that we have to uh, handle, so we've got explicit support for that. So here's a, uh, uh, a diagram of um, uh, verifying Grub from the firmware. So. Uh, um, uh, Grub, uh, uh, or the, the uh, firmware, uh, detects the appended uh, signature in an ELF note uh, in the Grub uh, binary. So we're using ELF notes to, to, to add things to, um, to ELF binaries. Uh, so we have one called appended signature and type ASIG. And um, uh, so the firmware is able to, to see that. Uh, then it, there's a separate ELF note for uh, the SBAT data and it's, it's literally just a, a, encapsulating a, uh, a CSV, which is the way it, it, it works uh, on uh, uh, UEFI systems. Um, and uh, uh, so it, the firmware reads these uh, um, uh, variables into um, various um, lists that, that uh, it maintains. And then it uh, verifies the grub binary uh, using uh, uh, the uh, Signature, trusted list, uh, uh, distrusted list, and SBAT list. So um, you, can, you can do individual revocations with you know hashes and certificates if you want to, but but really, uh, uh, I, I expect we'll rely on SBAT uh, strongly going forward. So then, uh, further verifying the the uh, kernel from Grub. 
uh, Grub reads the DB and DBX uh, from PKS into uh, trusted list and distrusted list, respectively. Uh, detects the appended signature um, from the uh, Linux kernel image and uh, validates the, the appended signature magic string and then reads the signature and then verifies that uh, using uh, the appended signature, the, the distrusted list and uh, the, the trusted list. So the kind of chain you might expect. Uh, and then further, um, we're uh, reading uh, trusted CADB and module DB from PKS and putting it into the machine keyring and secondary keyring, respectively. Um, and then uh, it, it reads the DB and DBX and stores them in the platform keyring and the blacklist keyring, respectively. Uh, the kernel then verifies the modules using the, the secondary keyring. Um, and then uh, uh, it can also verify the next k exec kernel. So we created a, a tool. Uh, we wanted at first to reuse uh, existing tooling uh, for uh, UEFI and, and the, 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 the shim, but uh, it turned out not to be real easy to sort of map into that. And we thought it would very likely be confusing uh, to, to have similar names uh, in, in the same tool that don't mean the same thing. So we created our own tooling out of convenience, uh, and uh, it also gives you a single uh, tool, not multiple tools you have to, to deal with, to deal with the uh, authenticated variables. So it simplifies the, uh, the process of, of creating the updates and reading and writing the, uh, the key material. Um, and it allows uh, easy communication over this uh, SysFS interface with, with PKS uh, that uh, we created. Um, and uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it supports these nine uh, predefined variables that I talked about. Uh, yes, we have to manually expand that in the future if we want to on both the, uh, the tool side and the kernel side. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll improve that in the future, I hope. Um, so to update and guess secure boot variables, uh, we, we have a specific uh, auth file format, uh, and uh, for the PK, the module DB, uh, the CAC, and the trusted CADB, uh, uh, the X509 public key must be in an uh, ESL. So once again, we're actually reusing structs and a little bit of code uh, from Tiano Core here. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, DB and GrubDB uh, can be an X509 uh, certificate or it can be a, uh, a binary hash uh, contained in an ESL. Uh, for DBX and GrubDB, uh, it can be an X509 public uh, key certificate or uh, the binary hash or a hash of the uh, uh, key. Um, that's uh, prohibited, so we, we have multiple ways of, of blocking uh, things we don't want uh, to use. And then, of course, SBAT. Uh, is everybody familiar with SBAT in, in here? I, I don't know if you are or not. Well, I really wasn't until we started looking at Grub, but it's it's pretty pretty cool way of not having to. Basically, the, the problem became that you need to do a bunch of revocations, and now you've got a bunch of either hashes or certificates you've got to store, and you can exhaust uh, your your uh, uh, well in the UEFI case, flash memory doing that. Uh, so they invented, a, the Grub uh, uh, maintainers invented a new mechanism to uh, compress that and basically say, I will not run anything older than this generation level. And uh, PE coughs already had uh, 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 generation information in them, so we, we just sort of borrowed that and, and uh, brought it over to, to ELF so, you know, others may uh, find it useful. But yeah, SBAT is actually really, really cool if you haven't looked at it. Um, so this is what the auth file uh, looks like. This is what we, we put our updates in. And uh, it's got an append header that uh, indicates whether the update is a replace or append. Uh, those are the two uh, operations we support. Uh, it's got uh, the, the auth info at the top. That's a signature that authorizes the, the update. And, um, and we didn't show the secure variables, but as you, you might imagine, there's, there's uh, timestamp and, and uh, uh, authorization information in, in the variables, and uh, I, I wish we had a slide on that, but we don't. Um, and then we have the, uh, the ESL uh, info at, the, uh, at, at the, the end of it here. 
uh, that actually contains the key material or the, uh, the SBAT uh, CSV. And it actually, yes, it is a CSV text file. Um, deletion's a special case. We pass empty data in the uh, ESL. These are what some of the commands uh, look like, uh, um, you know, the, the kind of what you might expect you might need uh, is uh, arguments to, to uh, generate the updates and uh, write, it, write them out to files. Um, so I'm going to get to the, uh, the demo section here. I have to go out of full screen. There we go. And I don't have control over this as it plays, so. Yay. So first demo is going to show creating um, uh, the uh, PKCAC DB uh, and uh, other variables, and then it's going to read them back. So let's try that. Oh, come on. Come on. Well, it may not go. There we go. So here uh, we're creating the PK. Oh, get back. Create the CAC. And then uh, we're we're creating the DB and um, that's, that's authorized by the CAC. We, th these are all using predefined keys, so sorry. It's a little bit fast, and I, I can't pause it. <laughs> so we're just basically generating all our, 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 our key hierarchy from uh, predefined keys here. And then we can uh, show the contents of them. So we'll see that the, um, if we look at the PK, We have our um, we have our ESL down at the bottom. And I think he's going to show this for multiple of the variables here. Just kind of what they contain. Same thing for the keck. This is DB. Um, authorized by the CAC. And I wish I had better narration for you, but I don't. And this is the yes bat, and you can actually see the uh, the CSV there uh, at the bottom that contains the, uh, the grub generation data, and we're doing this on Fedora. So that was the first demo. Let's see, let me get back to here. Page down, there we go. So here's the update scenario. So we actually, uh, there's, there's a flag to the verify command that, that um, um, requests the update, strangely enough, and that might, we might want to make that uh, an explicit command, but that's the way we're, uh, we're submitting the updates right now. So this is actually writing through the sysfs interface. It, it verifies the, uh, the auth file, and then it writes it out uh, through the sysfs interface. Uh, that's the uh, new interface that um, uh, Nina Jane started and uh, Andrew Donnellan and uh, Russell Curry uh, on our Australia team uh, completed uh, and uh, submitted upstream. And uh, it's now in the kernel. So after these, uh, these updates get written to um, the PKS, we can actually read them back. Um, and this is what we're, we're going to use when we actually boot up the, uh, the bootloader and, and the kernel uh, to, uh, to do the, the verification. Um, 
and um, it's not a general purpose, uh, it's not a, a very nice uh, uh, SysFS interface. Uh, we, we can't create files in there or anything, and uh, we've, we've talked about some kind of Baroque mechanisms we might be able to use to create new <laughs> entries in there, but uh, that's something we'll, we'll think about doing in the future. But for right now, we, we're just fine with having the, the predefined uh, variables. So we've read the variables back successfully, I think. In our, or no, we, he's just written them now, so he's going to read, read them back here. Yep. So he's basically showing that we get back uh, what we put into it. I think he'll show the SBAT, and you'll see the SBAT uh, CSV once again. He's written it out. All right. And finally, uh, SBAT. All right, I think that's this one. All right, and then we have one more, which is especially exciting because it actually shows the kernel bidding. So we actually have the, we've established the keys now uh, using our, our tool and the SysFS interface and PKS. Now we're gonna boot up um, Grub and we'll see that uh, we get some messages here. Uh, this is a power LPAR booting up, what it looks like. And uh, we see we've, we've actually now got some new messages here. Um, showing that we found keys, and, and Grub wouldn't have come up had it failed the validation, and we're not showing the negative cases here, just in the interest of time. But it does actually fail if you tamper in any way, or don't have the keys present, or don't, uh, don't have the signature present. So um, you can also um, look at the keys from Grub uh, and I think this is the last thing he's going to show here. So we can actually uh, list them out here and, and see them. And then finally, I think he just boots up uh, into the kernel. So we're getting very close and um, to uh, having something that's reasonably feature complete. Uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, I'm, I know we'll have some additional uh, work we have to do um, to complete it. And I, I talk about that on a at the very end on a slide, if we can get done with this. I think this will finish in a couple of seconds. There we are. All right, let me go back to slideshow mode. All right, so the roadmap. Uh, ignore the uh, kernel versions on here, we've already missed them. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it'll, it, I, I now imagine that, that the kernel pieces are going uh, to largely go into uh, 6.5. Uh, but we have a, a, a firmware uh, piece. We have a new firmware uh, coming out uh, that should be out uh, later this year that will have the uh, uh, dynamic key management support for Secure Boot in it. Uh, PKS is already there, it's just we, we have some additional uh, processing uh, we needed to add to the, the firmware to process the authenticated variables. Um, uh, Grub, uh, we hope to get upstream review 
in June. Its grub is, you know, constrained resource-wise. You know, uh, there, there are not many people participating in the grub community, and that's a real problem for grub. Uh, and it's something we've run into repeatedly uh, as we've gotten down into the space. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that, that around June, uh, Daniel will be able to, uh, to, to look at it. Uh, and we can get it into an upcoming grub release. Uh, the distros both, uh, well, the distros tend to have uh, downstream grub repositories, which sort of tells you about like the dysfunction in the upstream. So uh, things tend to get applied there. So they may get applied into these downstream grub repos uh, bef before they actually get applied to the, the upstream, but they, they at least need to go through a review first. Um, the uh, PLPKS and PLPKS system uh, or uh, SysFS uh, interface patches uh, have already made it into the kernel. Uh, so that's available now. Uh, the third party signed module support for the, the, the trusted CADB and module DB should be in the likely the 6.5 kernel. Um, oh, one of the interesting things that we ran into is we have this thing called the runtime abstraction services. And they, this allows you to manage your uh, 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 logical partition in various ways. And um, it, it's, it's got a, 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 a privileged user space component that up to now has talked through DevMem. And you can imagine how well that plays uh, along with Lockdown. So immediately uh, you, you turn on lockdown and you can't, you know, see how many CPUs you have, you know, you can't dynamically change anything on your LPAR, uh, and yet you don't want people to have access to dev mem. So um, right now you either break RTAS and can't effectively manage your LPAR, that's one of the uglinesses of our current solution, uh, or you poke holes in dev mem just for RTAS. And you obviously don't want to do that, but that's all you can do right now. So there's a new message passing interface to RTAS that's being uh, developed by Nathan Lynch uh, uh, in the LTC there uh, on the kernel team. And uh, I, that's what, unlikely to be six, well, it's not 6.4 either, that's probably 6.5 or farther out. Uh, but we really need that function to, to have a nice management experience uh, for uh, system administrators and the corresponding changes in uh, libartas. Um, and, uh, and arguably, uh, applying lockdown and finding this big, ugly interface that we, I, I didn't really realize existed was a really good thing, right? It's just like it, it breaks things when we, we lock it down. Um, Secfar Cuddle uh, uh, was uh, uh, made available as part of the uh, open power uh, GitHub, and uh, we're uh, just simply updating that, and it'll handle both open power and the the uh, LPAR uh, or KVM guest cases. Um, and then we have another component that's libstb secfar. This is kind of a confusing one, so uh, we just open sourced this. Um, however, it's included in our firmware, so our firmware is proprietary, and we. Um, don't you know make that available, but we wanted uh, the whole secure variable um, uh, life cycle to be reviewable and auditable. So um, uh, we made uh, this available uh, on GitHub. You can actually build it and you can do testing in, in user space if you care to do so. And it might have some value uh, for other reasons in the future, but that's actually included in the firmware. So future work. Um, we need to sign and verify the grub config file. Um, uh, grub can currently use uh, GPG detached signatures, uh, but you, you basically have to sign everything with GPG and nobody seems to be really using this and everybody, rather than signing the, the grub modules, they just simply uh, have to build them in. And we ran into this with the, uh, the TPM2 uh, support when we wanted it on power. Uh, it's like, oh, it's not there. Uh, uh, distros, can you please build this, uh, this module in because we can't load it. Um, so we're not actually planning on using the GPG mechanism, but we're gonna use detached uh, PKCS7 signatures like a, very much like a detached uh, appended signature. 
uh, to do this uh, in the same style we've, we've uh, uh, used for the, uh, the bootloader and the kernel. Uh, so, um, and, and this is a real important piece in, in, in having a, a full chain of trust all the way up. And it, it's a deficiency uh, across the board, really, across architectures, unless you're using this uh, GPG mechanism or some other mechanism to verify it. Um, we need some way to sign and verify the MFS. You know, and I know we, we talked about this uh, 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 at various points. Uh, I think in one of the BOFs we were talking about this, uh, how, how, how we might uh, uh, use, uh, uh, go to user space to, to do this, right? But yes, I want extended attributes in the init RAMFS, and then we can use IMA to, to uh, verify the files in it. Uh, there are other things we could contemplate. You know, and there's the uh, you know, uh, unified uh, kernel image uh, uh, potential there, but uh, right now that is um, UEFI specific. Uh, and we still need third-party modules for storage and network drivers and maybe even the crypto adapter if you're storing uh, key material in that that you need to use to boot. So we're not, in my opinion, we're not going to get away from the internet RAMFS for a while. So we need some way to secure it. And IMA provides us a really uh, flexible way of, of doing that if we just have the CPIO support. So um, we, we, I, I hope we can find some way to, to, to make that happen. Um, kernel SBAT, I don't know if it makes sense to extend the SBAT concept to the kernel. Uh, this is something we're thinking about uh, so that we could revoke the kernel um, uh, generations that uh, you know, uh, may be vulnerable, old and vulnerable. Uh, and we're evaluating whether uh, we want to do that or not, and we would probably do it in kind of a similar way that we're doing it in Grub. Um, ah, and then a non-goal is uh, cross-architecture key management interface unification. So when um, Nina proposed the uh, interface for PLPKS, uh, Greg KH said, great, I don't want to see another Arch-specific solution. So could you please come up with some unified solution for this? Uh, talk to the Cocoa people. Well, our, our problem's a little different than Cocoa, right? We're not injecting secrets. You know, we're, we're, we, we've got public keys we, we, we need to protect. Um, and um, so we, you know, we, 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 we actually did a, 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 an implementation of something that, that would be usable for a generic interface. But, uh, then it's like, well, you know, you need uh, to have at least three users of this interface <laughs> for, for me to, to bring this into the kernel. And what's the incentive for, you know, uh, uh, x86-64 uh, to, to move to a new interface? Absolutely none. Uh, things work, you know, so. Um, so we, we went back to the drawing board and said, we're just going to have a simplistic approach and extend the... Uh, the existing open power interface, and we'll have fixed variable names, and we will have minimal code required to get this into the kernel, and that's not necessarily a, a bad thing from a, uh, a, a simplicity perspective. Um, so that's, that's where we are now. I'm not sure if it will ever make sense to um, try to come up with some unified uh, key interface, but um, yeah, we, we at least had that discussion, you know, a fairly long discussion about it, and, and uh, ended up just doing something arch specific anyway that worked for us. So that was a little, little less satisfying a solution than, than we hoped for, but uh, anyway, that's where we are. So uh, we do stand on the backs of giants and many people have contributed to our work over the years. Um, I, I, I would especially like to thank Sudakar because uh, he took over uh, work uh, when uh, uh, Daniel Axton's uh, uh, left our team. Uh, Daniel contributed uh, major portions of the dynamic key solution, uh, so I'd like to thank him. Uh, and um, uh, also uh, Russell Curry and Andrew Donnellan on our OzLabs team uh, who've worked with us on SysFS patches. Uh, Nina Jane uh, and Eric Richter worked extensively on open power and completed the open power secure boot and have made major contributions. Uh, to uh, the uh, dynamic key management work and many, many others in various parts of the organization. 
So thanks for listening today. And if there are any questions, I'll try to answer them. And I'll have Sudocker on uh, Slack to, to bug if uh, I can't answer them. Uh, hi. So um, uh, so so I uh, I I have two quest questions. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, so um, so um, so it sounded like the signature of the grub bina b binary is embedded in the grub binary itself and in an elf section. So so I'm wondering how you're exactly how you're verifying the um verifying the grub binary if the signature is potentially located somewhere in the middle of of it and the um and the second question is whether you're also authenticating the kernel c command 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 line i i was i was going to ask about the grub config file too but that was mentioned in the future work right so yeah, kernel command line, we, we are not locking down in any way. Hopefully we can um, uh, mostly rely on the, the, the grub config file. Do, 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 what else would we need to lock down on the kernel command line? I'm wondering if we lock down the, the grub config file. Uh, I mean, it, oh, we need to do command filtering in grub is basically what it that comes down to, I think. We, we had talked about doing that, limiting the commands in grub uh, so that you couldn't alter the kernel command line potentially. But uh, we, haven't, we haven't gotten that far uh, yet. But that's, that is, yeah, we, we have discussed filtering. For the, the appended signature in grub, the elf note, we have elf notes that indicate, I didn't go into all the details, but they indicate the, um, the position and length of the, the appended signature in grub. And it, it's always stuck at the, the bottom, but the firmware has difficulty, at, like you said, like figuring out where it is. So the, the firmware actually looks for the elf note to figure out the, the position and size of the appended signature at the end. And, um, that's, that's how it does it, so. Hopefully that answers your questions. And if, if and the doctor might have a better answer for you. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. When, when you're updating the keys, do you use uh, timestamps? Yes, yeah. We, yeah, yeah, we do, and um, we also maintain that state in the secure variables, and that's why I said I wish we had a, a, a slide that actually showed the actual format of the secure variables in the uh, hypervisor memory so that you could see that. But yeah, we, we do maintain a timestamp so we can prevent replay attacks. So yeah, absolutely. Thanks. This is a bit of a meta question. I couldn't find the slides for this. Oh, line. we need to post them. Yeah, some people have said they've posted them that they haven't arrived, but just maybe a reminder to folk. Because we're, it's definitely interesting. We need to post yeah. them, yep. Share with people. We will. All right. So you talked about your secure boot story, um, but you, early on you mentioned you also have a measured boot approach. Mm -hmm. We haven't completed that. This, this is also work in progress. We, we, we have certain measurements, um, and we, we don't, we're not measuring the certificates right now, and we know we need to measure the certificates, uh, and we haven't done a thorough analysis to see what else we need to measure. Uh, but yeah, we, we now at least have the, uh, the kernel uh, 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 measurements um, uh, and, and grub. So um, we, we know that the, the certificates are an incomplete portion of the chain. So yeah, we need to do that. Uh, until recently, uh, we didn't have grub. So we, we had a really bad story there. So that's, that's incomplete. That's um, kind of why I'm glossing over that a little bit. And then we also need um, to test it out with end-to-end -end attestation with Keylime or something, which you know, we, we haven't really done either. So we definitely have more work to do uh, on that portion of it as well.
All right. No more questions? All right. Thanks, everyone.